100 million Americans without a warrant. Has he read this document which he was sworn to uphold? I will not have you libel Abraham Lincoln. I don't understand the problem with registering guns. We register cars. Mark Levine brings you the news the government doesn't want you to know. Today, an explosive story about connections between white supremacists and Islamic terrorists. When there's a conflict between Scalia's conservative values and the Constitution of the United States, he throws away the Constitution. When we do have secret prisons, that is not what America's all about. Let's go to Mark in five, four, three, two. Hello, America. Welcome to the Inside Scoop. As you know, the Inside Scoop reports on the news from Washington. But rarely do we report on the news from the District of Columbia. Now, you may think that they're one and the same, and technically you'd be right. Physically, Washington occupies the same space as the District of Columbia. But mentally, they're worlds away. When people speak of Washington, whether within the Beltway or outside the Beltway, people are talking about the federal city, the capital of the United States, the Congress, the White House, the policies of the federal government. But the District of Columbia, which takes the same space as Washington, is kind of a very different place. It's families living in a number of homes, working in their businesses, raising children, trying to have the same life as other Americans, paying taxes, serving in the military, serving on juries. It is the last occupied territory in the United States, America's last colony. These supposedly ordinary people, many of whom are working for the federal government, sacrificing perhaps higher wages elsewhere to serve their government, are denied the same equal rights that every other American has under the law. The people of the District of Columbia are the only people south of Canada and north of Mexico that do not have democratic rights. Why is that? Well, it comes from an obscure provision in the Constitution. The founders wanted to keep the District of Columbia, the seat of government, separate from all of the 50 states. And maybe it made sense in that time when the district was seen as a temporary place for people to go say their votes and then go back to their home states. But it doesn't really make much sense right now. The people of DC want a vote. They want to vote in the House of Representatives. They want to vote in the Senate. Worse than the fact that the residents of DC don't have a vote in the district, they don't even have control over their own local affairs. The various states can decide what they want locally. Many conservatives, in fact, support states' rights and local control. Not with regard to the District of Columbia, if the people's elected representatives in the district, the mayor and the city council do something that Congress doesn't like, Congress just overturns it. And they overturn it without even a representative of the district being there. So what's the solution? Statehood? Returning the territory to Maryland? Perhaps it's a new bill promoted by this administration and the Congress to finally give DC a vote in the House, if not the Senate. But as always, there's a catch-22. The National Rifle Association has insisted that senators and members of the House include in the bill, giving D.C. a seat in Congress, a voting seat in Congress, a provision to take away the district's authority to regulate guns. It's a tough poison pill to swallow. And it leaves the residents of Districts of Columbia with a catch-22. If they want the same rights as every American, they have to give away even more of their local control. To discuss this issue, I've invited Jaylene Quinto. She is the Communications Director for DC Vote. Jaylene, welcome to the Inside Scoop. Thank you for having me. I want to go through, first of all, the history of how we got in this situation, because uh, this situation is very familiar to all the residents of DC, mm -hmm. but for people in Virginia, Maryland, and certainly for people beyond mm -hmm. California, Alaska, they may not realize that the residents of DC don't have the same rights as yeah. other Americans. Why is that? Well, you know, there's a historical reason in that uh, Congress kind of punted this issue. They just said, yeah, I'm, I'm, there were a number of members of Congress and a number of historical documents that said, um, that pointed to the fact that the founding fathers knew they were creating a situation which would, future Congresses would need to make a decision upon. Um, you know, they tell, never- Tell me about this, because I have, I'd like to show our sure. listeners a provision. This is the uh, main provision, the one that created mm -hmm. the District of Columbia. Uh, and this is a provision from Section 8 of Article 1 of the Constitution. It says that Congress has the power to exercise exclusive legislation in all cases whatsoever over such district, not exceeding 10 miles square, as may by session of particular states and the acceptance of Congress become the seat of government of the United States. 
And so what happened, of course, is uh, there was this nice little town, Alexandria, Virginia, and this mm -hmm. nice town, Georgetown, Maryland, and they sort of came together to form this district. Mm -hmm. And in doing so, they lost their voting rights. Why is that? Yes, and so and for a time, actually, um, under the Organic Act, they were given voting rights, and then they were taken away. Uh, so it's it's an interesting situation, and it's one that happens over and over in uh, contemporary issues in Congress, where you know Congress says, "We know we're creating a problem. We'll leave that for future Congresses to decide." And that's um, and an it, important issue that you it, make. The first ten years, mm -hmm. the residents of the district actually did have representation. Yes, they did. Uh, they did have representation, and. Uh, and so there are a number of people who will argue that the Founding Fathers never intended that. Um, the Founding Fathers, I, I believe the historical uh, documents point to the fact that they knew they were creating this situation and there were a number of them, including Alexander Hamilton, who tried to um, amend the situation and it just it didn't happen. So here we are in 2009 um, and really the biggest hurdle to DC getting a vote in Congress is the fact that most people don't know about this. You mentioned, you know, a number of people in Virginia and Maryland, um, uh, a lot of viewers of this show don't know that this problem exists. Much and less viewers in Indiana exactly, or South Dakota or Nevada. Exactly. So really at the heart of this issue is people just don't know. People support democracy. Um, they support... Why wouldn't DC people support democracy <laughs> for Americans? It, I mean, it makes exactly, sense. Exactly. And, you know, I, I had the pleasure of uh, traveling to three of the seven states the D.C. vote went to uh, last year. And this is an issue that resonates with everyday Americans in places like Montana, in Oregon, in Mississippi. Um, Americans care about a vote in Congress. It's not symbolic to them. Okay, but uh, Republicans say, and, and, and mm -hmm. let's face it, the reason why Republicans and Democrats are on this issue, you can argue that Democrats believe in fairness and the right mm -hmm. of people to vote, and Republicans are against fairness, but let's face it, D.C. is a very Democratic jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. They tend to vote for Democrats, and a lot of Republicans don't want to give them voting rights if it means that there's going to be one more Democratic representative in the House and two more Democrats in the Senate. Yeah, there, there is that little issue of partisan politics at play when it comes to giving D.C. a vote in Congress because um, it is an overwhelmingly uh, Democratic majority. I think something like 92 percent of uh, D.C. residents uh, voted for Obama in the last election. Right. I recall um, even for John Kerry, uh, George Bush didn't, yeah, didn't crack the 10 percent mark. No, no, he did not. Um, but you know, it, it's, it's one of those things where it, it's not just Democrats. It's not, it's Republicans, independents. Everyone wants to cast their vote. Uh, one of our strongest coalition partners is actually the D.C. Republican Committee. Hmm. Um, they work side by side on this issue with us as well. We're, of course, a nonpartisan uh, organization. Um, and, and this is something that everyone can agree on. We deserve a vote in Congress. D.C. residents, um, the st uh, a study just came out with the most recent census numbers, um, and D.C. residents pay $6.5 million, billion dollars, excuse me, annually in federal taxes and are denied a vote in Congress. That, that mantra of uh, no taxation without representation um, you know, that goes as far back as the Boston Tea Party is something that still resonates with people. It still means something. Now, how much do you think partisan politics resonates? If the District of Columbia were approximately 50% Democrats and 50% Republicans, would they have gotten a vote, you think, much sooner? That's a good question. I, th I think that if they're, you know, it, it's definitely a possibility. If D.C. didn't lean so heavily Democrat, um, you know, it, it could be s the same scenario if we had Democrats in control and D.C. leaned so heavily Republican. Hard to imagine. Um, but if, if that were to happen, yeah, I, I think that would still be at play. Um, you know, the unfortunate side of this is that this is an issue that's been a centuries-long problem and it still has not been resolved. And right now, you know, partisan politics are at play. Um, I know we're gonna get to the gun amendment, which uh, is something that we- But before we even get to the gun amendment, mm -hmm. it's interesting, the only way DC is getting a vote, even without the gun amendment, mm -hmm. is they're gonna give another seat to Utah, too, to, to one of the most Republican states in the United yeah. States. And that was the only way to get enough Republicans on board in the Senate so they didn't filibuster the bill. Yeah. Apparently, and this is surprising to me, without giving a representation to Utah, an extra one, mm -hmm. They couldn't get a single Republican to vote that American citizens should have the right to representation in Congress. They had to have that, mm -hmm. that little poll where there's no, still no representation mm -hmm. in the Senate and then one Democrat for one Republican. No, it, it's an unfortunate side of partisan politics. I think um, it, what 
isn't reflected in uh, the, the votes in Congress is just the general sentiment of American people. We did a poll that showed 78% of Americans don't know about this issue, so that's obviously... 78%, 78% of Americans nationwide don't know that D.C. No. residents don't have the same rights they, as other Americans. They have no idea. They have no wow. idea that nearly 600,000 Americans who pay taxes, serve on juries, fight and die in wars, are denied a vote in Congress. They're all they coming no here for the cherry blossom season. Maybe we can have <laughs> this, this big sign that says, yeah. please, let yeah. us have the same rights well, you have. Well, you know, if we have some volunteers, we've got some bumper stickers. We Good. Can I hope you let them out. know, because Americans come here all the time, yeah. and, they, and they see the institutions of government, and they don't realize yeah. that the very place they're standing is occupied territory. Absolutely. And what's, you know, so that was a, that's a disheartening figure, but what we found out was that 82% of Americans, and that, that was a 50-50 split. It was a it was uh, Republicans and Democrats. Um, everyone agrees that D.C. deserves voting representation in Congress. Okay. Now, there are people who say, uh, and, and, and it may be that coincidentally they're mm -hmm. Republican partisans, or maybe that they actually believe, look, the Constitution is the Constitution. Mm -hmm. It has done some awful things. Slavery was allowed by the Constitution. Uh, African Americans were three-fifths of a person. But to get the change, mm -hmm. we had to amend the Constitution. And people who are opposed to giving the DC, uh, the people of DC voting rights, mm -hmm. they point to two provisions, which I'm going to show up on the screen now. One is about the House of Representatives. And it says that the House of Representatives shall be composed of members chosen every second year by the people of the several states. Goes on to say the electors in each state shall have the same qualifications as the, num is the most numerous branch of the state legislature. They say, look, this provision's talking about states. There's nothing in here about the District of Columbia. There is no state legislature in the District of Columbia. It's not one of the several states. And further, they point to the Senate. There was an amendment, the 17th Amendment, uh, this was ratified in 1913. It used to be that senators were chosen by each of the individual states uh, by their own legislatures. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, in 1913, we decided to do that directly by the people. It says the Senate of the United States should be composed of two senators from each state elected by the people thereof. Couldn't be more clear. So even if it's right and it's fair mm -hmm. to allow the residents of the district mm -hmm. to have the right to vote, just as it was right and fair not to have slavery, the Constitution is the Constitution. Yeah. It governs us. As long as that's here, there are people that say, I'm sorry, it may be wrong, but unless you change this document, we've got to obey the law. Yeah. How do you respond to them? Well, listen, I, I, I think this question is so multi-tiered, and I, I think Senator Orrin Hatch, uh, during the cloture vote in the Senate, actually said it best. He said, people who argue um, that, well, D.C. is not a state, he said, that's a, that's a premise. That's not a constitutional argument. Um, and in fact, uh, you know, DC vote is not alone. We're, we're joined by even conservative constitutional scholars like Viet Din, author of the Patriot Act, uh, Kenneth Starr, who um, was not exactly a friend of the Clintons. No, no, he, he <laughs> led the impeachment. Um, uh, they uh, they all agree that uh, the other section of the Constitution, the district clause that actually sets up the district, gives Congress this broad authority to confer voting representation in Congress upon the DC. Uh, residents of DC. So that's the first provision I, I read. The one that yes. says that Congress has the power to exercise exclusive legislation in all cases whatsoever exactly. over such district. Well, I don't know. It seems to me kind of like the Constitution contradicts itself, <laughs> and I'm not sure what happens in that yeah. case. Except that normally, when yeah. it happens, the Supreme Court makes the final decision. When we come back, I want to discuss the possibility of court legislation over all of this. That even if you get it through Congress. Maybe the United States Supreme Court is going to take your rights away. Folks, if you want to call in and comment on this, agree or disagree, I want to hear from you. The toll-free number is 888-488-MARK, 888-488-6275. We'll be right back after this. I helped turn my child's public school into a whole new kind of school. One with a curriculum that really motivates kids. One that has extended hours, six days a week, year-round. With loads of academic, cultural, and recreational activities. One that has support services, like medical and dental, right there. A school where parents' involvement is encouraged. Where teachers have more time to teach. And students are excited about learning. There's just one problem. My child doesn't ever want to come home. 
You can help turn your school into a community school for excellence. Find out how. Call 1-877-LOVE-TO-LEARN. It's coming right to your neighborhood. And when it does, you may be surprised. It's your social security statement of your benefits, and it's going to help you plan your financial future. Your benefit statement will tell you how much social security you're eligible to receive and when you'll get it. Then you'll know how much you need to save for retirement, because that's coming too. The future is in your hands. Choose to save. The toxic fumes from this meth lab are seeping into Jamie's sinus cavity. Ammonia vapors invade her throat. Toxic gases fill her lungs. Jamie's body is deteriorating. And she doesn't even know it. Jamie, dinner. So, who has the drug problem now? Find out how meth affects you at drugfree.org slash meth. Here again, the Inside Scoop with Mark Levine. Welcome back to the Inside Scoop. The founders of our nation, the people who wrote the Constitution, weren't perfect. They made some mistakes. Some of them were glaring errors. Women didn't have the right to vote. Slavery existed. And indeed, African Americans were counted as three-fifths of a person. There were many problems in the original Constitution. And perhaps because those errors were so glaring and so awful, a lot of people didn't concentrate on the less important errors. But these errors matter a lot to the people of the District of Columbia who live here, who work here, who work very hard for their country, but don't have a right to representation in Congress. The only Americans between Canada and Mexico that don't have that right. My guest is Jaleen Quinto. She is the Communications Director for DC Vote. Jaleen, prior to the break, we were talking about this conflict in the Constitution. Mm -hmm. You have this one clause that says Congress can do whatever it wants exercise exclusive legislation in all cases whatsoever over the District of Columbia. Mm -hmm. That's pretty broad. Mm -hmm. But then there are the other two parts. The one that says House of Representatives is chosen by the people of the several states yes. and uh, the Senate is chosen, two senators from each state. Is it your view that Congress can give D.C. without conferring statehood a representative in the House and two representatives in the Senate? Yes, absolutely. And as I was saying, it's, it's not just my view or DC Votes view, but uh, the view of a number of constitutional scholars much smarter about the Constitution than I am. Um, and I think another th important thing to note about this argument that DC is in a state is uh, the 16th Amendment also says that the federal government can levy taxes on among the several states. I That's mean, true. I, I, and DC is not a state, and yet they pay the second highest per capita in the nation. That's a really good point. I have the 16th Amendment right here, my pocket constitution, <laughs> which I carry with me at all times. I recommend you do the same. It says right here, the Congress shall have the power to lay and collect taxes on incomes without apportionment among the several states. So if DC is not a state, maybe you shouldn't be paying your taxes, uh, folks in DC. That's certainly been an argument. Um, and you know, a number of uh, people have said, well, why don't we just take away uh, federal taxation? Well, the fact of the matter is that doesn't solve the core issue, which is that DC deserves a voice in Congress. They want to be part of the country. They, they are, after all, the nation's capital. Exactly. You think they might want to be, they're, they're a little bit different from, say, Guam or, yeah. or Puerto Rico, perhaps. Yeah, they are, absolutely. They're, and that, that's been another question we get frequently, which is uh, talking about the U.S. territories. Uh, well, the territories, and you know, they, there are a lot of people who serve our country from the territories, so I by no means belittling them, but the, there is a much different situation that's unique. What is the difference between Guam, Puerto Rico, and the District the, of Columbia? The biggest difference is that they don't pay federal taxes. Okay. Um, so they, citizens of the territories do not pay federal taxes, and they are not eligible for the draft in times of war. Okay. Um, and they don't vote for our president. No, they don't. I mean, they, they have some primary votes, mm -hmm. I know, but they cannot, they don't have electoral votes. Uh, D.C., by the way, didn't have electoral votes until 1964 no. with yes. a constitutional amendment. So here's the question. If this thing goes before the United States Supreme Court, I don't think it, you or I know how mm -hmm. they would rule. I yeah. mean, you have this provision that says, you know, Congress has exclusive power. And you have these other provisions that says mm -hmm. the several states get to vote. Um, any predictions? It's a dangerous thing to do. <laughs> you know, I, I work for DC Vote. I work on a centuries old issue, so I'm, I'm definitely a half glass full <laughs> okay. type of person. So I, I you know, I, I think that we have great support. I think we have a lot of support in Eric Holder. 
um, who will uh, really, who's really supportive of D.C. voting rights. The Attorney Obviously, General of the United States. The Attorney General. Yeah, but um, it, it, he doesn't decide. It's, it's nine no, people No, but up we, there. we know that uh, he's going to vigorously defend any lawsuits. Uh, we're, of course, not taking anything for granted at D.C. Vote or with our coalition partners. We actually have secured the assistance of no fewer than four law firms to start working preemptively on this issue. Okay, but Jaylene, what's the point? I mean, here it is. You, you lose your gun rights. Mm -hmm. You have to give Utah a representative. Uh, even if it passes, you're going to have a challenge in the United States Supreme Court that could take many years and lots of money. I got an answer for you. Yeah. The Constitution says that the states get to choose the senators and the House of Representatives. Mm -hmm. If the District of Columbia were a state, the state of Columbia perhaps, mm -hmm. uh, if Columbia, the new state of Columbia, were to exist, you wouldn't have any constitutional problems. It only requires a majority vote of mm -hmm. Congress to admit a new state. You'd have representation in Congress, and you'd even have local control. Sounds perfect. It sounds ideal. I mean, it would be Christmas for all of D.C. <laughs> well, why, um, why, why, why aren't you advocating for that? Uh, you know, D.C. vote is not anti-statehood. And, and as a matter of fact, the D.C. Voting Rights Act, which is um, stalled right now in the House, is a huge step towards um, fuller democracy for D.C. Um, the votes don't exist for statehood. Right now, in the House or the Senate or both? Both. Really? Not even in the democratically controlled House? No. In uh, 1993, actually, a statehood bill was tried um, under Clinton and under uh, democratically controlled uh, Congress and failed uh, almost two to one. Really? And, and had um, the no votes, I believe, of over 100 Democrats. Now, here's, okay, so now there's another possibility mm -hmm. besides statehood, and that is you don't like the Constitution, you amend it. Mm -hmm. In the 1970s, they got two-thirds of the House and the Senate to amend the Constitution mm -hmm. to give D.C. full rights, right, House and mm -hmm. Senate seats. What happened there? Uh, you know, it's, it, it's a tough sell. That would take a lot of money and a lot of resources um, to get the message out to the states that this is an important issue. Like I said, 78% of Americans don't know about this. Uh, so at the local level, getting people to act upon that is going to be very difficult. Uh, and also in the 1970s, they did pass Congress, but it didn't pass the legislatures of the several states. Of course, a constitutional amendment requires two thirds of the House, two thirds of the Senate, and three quarters mm -hmm. of all state legislatures. But it seems to me that a simple law is a heck of a lot easier. You don't need two thirds of Congress. You don't need any of the states. All you need, I mean, you, would agree with mm -hmm. me that no one could challenge the constitutionality of a simple majority up or down vote in the House and the Senate mm -hmm. to give D.C. statehood, right? Uh, no, that, I mean, certainly. I think there, that's certainly a viable option. Um, unfortunately, it's, uh, no, excuse me, it's not a viable option. But not a politically, vi <laughs> politically it's a legal, viable. Politically viable. Legally viable, but not politically viable. Not exactly. politically viable. Um, and, it, you know, it's, it can be a final destination, but right now our focus is on getting this vote in the House, um, which is a monumental step. It's been over 90 years since the size of the House of Representatives has been ex expanded. And this would be um, a permanent expansion to 437? Or it just would be. It would be a permanent expansion, one seat permanently going to D.C. and one seat going to Utah for the time being um, until the next census. Until the next census when it would go to the states that would, yes. that would normally get it. So. There are other options. Uh, there are, I'm sure you've heard the argument that people saying, now wait a minute, it's not mm -hmm. fair. Yeah, it's not fair for the residents of Washington, D.C. to have fewer rights than mm -hmm. other Americans, but it's not fair for them to have more rights either. I mean, you have New York City, the nation's largest city, a much bigger city than mm -hmm. Washington, and they don't have a separate state. They've got to be part of New York State. Los Angeles has to be mm -hmm. part of California. Washington is a city. It's smaller than Los Angeles or New York City. Why should it have two senators separate from Maryland and Virginia? Well, I mean, obviously the huge difference between uh, Manhattan and uh, D.C. residents is uh, Manhattan res residents enjoy <laughs> congressional representation. That doesn't exist for D.C. Um, there also isn't a clause of the Constitution that sets up the, uh, you know, the, uh, the island of Manhattan as the seat of the federal government with uh, you know, specific congressional authority. Um, so there, those are very different situations, and I, I've definitely heard that argument before. It's, uh, you know, it's apples and oranges. Well, but, you know, uh, there is history here. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the city of Alexandria, uh, where I happen to live, used to be part of the District of Columbia. It used to be 10 square miles. I have these old maps of the full <laughs> district that I have in my house. Uh, people didn't realize there used to be Alexandria, D.C., Georgetown, D.C., mm -hmm. and Washington, D.C. It used mm -hmm. to be a, a, a district had three different cities in it. 
And the people of Alexandria, the people of that part of the District of Columbia, were tired of not having representation. And they had some other ideas on their mind, like slavery and awful things like that. But the point is that they voted to return to Virginia. Mm -hmm. And Virginia agreed, and the federal government agreed, and that's the reason why Alexandria is in Virginia today. Mm -hmm. Couldn't the residents on the other side of the Potomac return to Maryland, and then they could, have, they could vote for the senators in Maryland, they could have representation, mm -hmm. they could have all the freedoms that the citizens of Alexandria and Virginia enjoy. Mm -hmm. The idea of retrocession um, is, it's a complicated one. It's much more complicated than a lot of um, people who, uh, who will say they're for retrocession would like you to believe. Uh, it, sets up, it sets up some very serious constitutional questions. First of all, what happens to that federal district who has authority over that? Um, and the only polling that's been done so far in Maryland and D.C. on the idea of retrocession, on the idea of giving D.C. back to Maryland, has shown that neither wants it. Maryland doesn't want it and the people of D.C. don't exactly. want it. I mean, you could, the Constitution is quite clear that the district can't exceed 10 miles square, but it could be smaller. You could mm -hmm. design a district that includes the National Mall, includes the White House and, and the Capitol, mm -hmm. and yet everywhere around it would be Maryland, right? Yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, it's, it's, it's an idea that has not been fleshed out ever. Why don't has, the people of D.C. want it? They would have representation. Why are they against it? Well, I, I think just as I, I've had this conversation with people in the States, and I'm originally actually from the other Washington. I'm originally from Seattle. Um, and I, I've told people, well, it just from a very kind of gut level, if someone told me I'm from Seattle, but all of a sudden we're going to give you back to Boise, Idaho, <laughs> Um, if for some reason that existed, I would have to say no. At the heart, I'm I'm a Seattleite. Uh, that's who I am. There's a long history. Of there's the a separation. long history. Um, you know, and and from Maryland's standpoint, it, there are a lot. Of, there's a huge financial burden that would be brought upon Maryland um, if DC were to join. Well, why is DC such a financial burden? Aren't its citizens prosperous and able to? Uh... It's a, the budget deficit that exists in DC. And again, I'm not a numbers person. I'm a communications person. Uh, is it, it would be a lot for Maryland to bear. Is it high because DC spends a lot of money to protect the federal government, the White House, the Capitol, and things that, frankly, if it were a separate, you know, Seattle, Washington, doesn't yeah. have to worry about protecting the president. No, the exactly. States. And there, it, you know, we saw that during the inauguration. Um, millions and millions of dollars was spent from the district government. To millions of people were here on the National Millions of people Ball. were here, exactly, to protect um, not only the president, but the, uh, the seat of the federal government. Obviously, there's the U.S. Capitol. Um, and D.C. doesn't get to uh, levy property taxes on any of those federal areas, which means we're in a constant state of deficit. So the center of uh, D.C., in mm. essence, is this sort of empty place for, for the government of D.C. Folks, if you have a question on this or a comment, agree or disagree, you want to express your opinion, please do so. That's what live television is all about. 888-488-MARK, 888-488-6275. When we come back, we're going to talk about the bill that has passed the House the one that's passed the Senate on this very issue. Around the world, one out of every three women will be beaten or otherwise abused in their lifetime, often by a family member or loved one. A future free from violence. It's all she's ever wished for. know you have the power to stop children from joining gangs. You can help a father find a job and home for his family. You can assist a woman who can't afford the medicine she needs to live in the home she can't live without. You can choose to make a difference in our community. Support Volunteers of America, and you can help improve the lives of nearly 2 million Americans each year with programs and services that help individuals and families overcome their challenges to become as independent as possible. Support the programs that are working in our community. Contact Volunteers of America today. Call 1-800-899-0089. For some folks, saving for the future is easy, but for you, it might take a little more effort. 
Saving for your future is your responsibility. And there's a lot to save for. I never thought of that. Like your child's education, perhaps uncovered medical expenses, or just to be sure you can live the way you want when you retire. The time is now to save for tomorrow. Save now or work forever. The choice is yours. Choose to save. Here again, the Inside Scoop with Mark Levine. Welcome back to the Inside Scoop. We'd only report on Washington. We report on the last occupied territory of the United States. The District of Columbia, the people whose district houses the federal government but have no rights within it. It's a strange anomaly left over from our Constitution. And people like Jane, Jaylene Quinto, <laughs> excuse me, my guest today from DC Vote, are trying to fix that situation. Okay, Jaylene, take us up to the present day. This bill to give Utah a seat mm -hmm. and give DC a vote. Where did this begin? How long has this been in the hopper? This was an interesting compromise that actually uh, originated with uh, Virginia's former representative, Tom Davis. Um, he and uh, Delegate Norton, uh, Eleanor Holmes Norton, who's the non-voting delegate for DC, uh, came up with an interesting compromise in 2007, which they attempted to push through, uh, <coughs> excuse me, it, um, this is the compromise that allowed uh, one representative from Republican Utah to be matched mm -hmm. with presumably Eleanor Holmes Norton, mm -hmm. for the, the Democrat from D.C., so the votes would cancel each other out, and so you could get Republican support for this. Exactly, and uh, unfortunately it came just three votes shy of uh, overcoming a filibuster in the Senate. So it passed the House, actually, with a large majority. Um, and this is back, not the current very Democratic House and Senate, this is the mm -hmm. old Congress, mm -hmm. the Congress before the election of President yes. Obama. So it passed the House, and it was three votes short of a Senate filibuster. Now, so that's 57 Senate votes. Yes. Today, of course, we've got uh, six or seven new Democratic seats. There are 58. Uh, those of us that mm -hmm. support Al Franken think there's going to be 59 <laughs> very soon. Democrats in the Senate. Mm -hmm. If you were three votes short then, you must have overwhelming support now, right? Well, we did just pass uh, on February 26th. Uh, a large majority of the Senate did pass this bill. Um, unfortunately, it came with a little caveat known as the uh, Ensign Amendment. Um, but right now, uh, yeah, we, we have an, a large support what in the House. What number of senators would support this bill without the Ensign Amendment, which we'll get to in just a second? Uh, that's a good question. I, I don't know that we have numbers on that. I don't think Okay, let's talk about the Ensign Amendment. John Ensign is a, a Republican senator from Nevada. Mm -hmm. You wouldn't think he would have these strong feelings on D.C. What was the Ensign Amendment? The Ensign Amendment uh, was an amendment to repeal all of D.C.'s gun laws. As repeal all of D.C.'s gun laws? All of D.C.'s gun laws. All uh, of them? It, it removed D.C.'s control over every aspect of, of gun laws uh, that they have, that currently enjoy. So, so gun laws that say, like, like what? That say you that can't register your firearm. Uh, you, you cannot have restrictions um, that force people to register their firearms. Okay, it allows so no people, gun registration. It allows people to uh, go to Maryland or Virginia or wherever they see fit to go purchase their guns and carry them across state lines um, and back into the district. And would allow people with mental illness or people that have committed uh, felonies, domestic sure, violence, to, sure. to have it, guns? Yes, it even went so far as to say that DC could not have a vision requirement for gun oh, ownership. Oh, great, great. So, uh, you could so, be so everyone would be like Dick Cheney. They, they would take yeah. their guns and end up shooting their friends. Yeah. Um, you know, we have a vision requirement for driving, mm -hmm. and uh, maybe I'm crazy to think that guns are at least as dangerous as cars. Yeah. Uh, but uh, so, so John Ensign wants to force the people of D.C. Mm -hmm. to have no gun restrictions under local law. Um, what do the people of D.C. think? I mean, do they agree with him? No, absolutely not. They, uh, the people of D.C. have spoken out time and time again on this issue. They don't want guns in the district. They want to vote in Congress. You know, it's uh, we've, well, has, there we've been, heard has there been a history of gun violence in D.C.? A, a big history of gun violence in D.C. You know, and even members of Congress who have supported the Ensign Amendment have admitted that yes, what happens in my rural district of you know of Mississippi of Arkansas 
uh, guns are used for a different reason there than they are used in the for district. Hunting. Yeah, They're you're not going to hunt <laughs> much in D.C. You might hit some people. Yeah, no, and, and uh, it's it's funny. There was a radio show last week where someone said, you know, there's not a whole lot of hunting going on in the District of Columbia. You know, these guns are used for violence. These well, here's what I don't get. Republicans, conservatives, claim to believe in states' rights. They claim mm -hmm. to believe in local control. They're mm -hmm. all about local control. Mm -hmm. When people wanted to desegregate the schools, they said, no, locally we believe in Jim Crow laws. Mm -hmm. We want local control. Uh, when people, they said, you know, get those feds off our property. Mm -hmm. If Mississippi wants to keep blacks and whites separated, that's Mississippi's rights, states' rights. They want local control with uh, speed limits, which makes perfect sense to mm -hmm. me. I mean, I, I don't. I don't think that Montana uh, mm -hmm. should be restricted. If they want to go 75 miles an hour, mm -hmm. it's a big state. They've got a lot of places to go. 75 probably wouldn't be a good idea on Rock Creek Park Drive in, yeah. in the District of Columbia. Why are they against states' rights with regard to gun control? Well, you know, I, I don't know if it's so much about gun control because this is an issue that comes up time and time again. Um, but it's for political gain. I mean, this is an issue where the NRA uh, is pressuring members of Congress um, they're going to score the vote. They're going to score the w vote. What does that mean, to score the vote? Uh, so essentially, the, what the situation we have in the House right now is that the NRA has threatened to score a procedural vote, which they've never done before. So, so essentially, just explain before, to our listeners who don't know what scoring a vote means. Yes, what so, does that mean? <laughs> uh, so meaning, before the House even considers a bill, they'll have a rules hearing where they'll say, these are the rules around which we will debate this bill, around which we'll amend or not amend the bill. Um, what the House members want to do, and which should be difficult based on the House rules, is to throw on any old amendment that you want. You know, saying an amendment that we're gonna ban red shoes um, on this voting rights bill. Well, Wearing red shoes has nothing to do with voting rights. Not Jermaine, as they <laughs> Not say Germain. in the legislative lingo. Exactly. So uh, the House rules should make it very difficult to say that uh, you know gun rights and voting rights have anything to do with each other. Um, well, I, I, but guess, I guess the heart of my issue is, what business does a senator from Nevada have mm -hmm. telling residents of D.C., uh, you can't have any gun laws. They have gun laws yeah. in Nevada. Why does John Ensign believe that the people of D.C. should have no freedom to choose their gun laws while his people deserve every freedom? Does he think that the people of, of Nevada just are better Americans, first-class citizens, D.C. or second-class? How does he justify this? Well, it, there, it, there is no justification. It, the heart of this is that he would never approve this kind of legislation in Nevada. That, and this it is takes away Nevada's rights to even pass legislation. Exactly. This is something that happens time and time again. Uh, Congress interferes with the district in ways they would never... This has happened never, before. It's not just on this gun amendment. Oh, no. It's happened with uh, needle exchange laws, as you know, um, you probably know, and probably many of your viewers know. Uh, D.C. has the highest rate of HIV infection in the country, um, more so even than some West African countries. Wow. Um, but what Congress did a couple of years ago, just because you know they didn't like it on a moral issue, or maybe they're trying to appease some of their their hometown voters, uh, was ban any needle exchange programs. They would not allow D.C. to use their funds for a needle exchange program. A needle exchange, of course, may make it a bit easier to use heroin, but a lot more likely you're going to die. Mm -hmm. So apparently, the people of the several states decided that they wanted district residents dead rather than using a drug. Well, and that's, that's certainly an extreme case. I mean, it happens in, in other cases, too, where, um, you know, a member of Congress, well intentioned or not, will try to pass, pass legislation in the district just as a testing ground, just to see, well, maybe I want to use this in my home district at some Why point. Why don't they test it in their own states? Why do <laughs> DC Why residents have to be the guinea pigs of these members of Congress? Because Congress, it, it, and this, you know, we have a number of fantastic allies in Congress. But certain members of Congress want to use D.C. as a testing ground. And they have the they power, so they abuse it. Exactly. Um, now, statehood would stop all this, but there's just not enough support for statehood. There isn't right now. Um, we're looking at statehood as an option down the road because, like I said, we are not anti-statehood. It's certainly um, a one, one way to remedy this problem. Let me give out the numbers again. It's 888-488-MARK, 888-488-6275. Again, you can agree or disagree with either one of us. <laughs> we welcome your calls. So let's go through this. So the House passed this bill in 2007. The Senate uh, filibustered it. They did get the 60 votes. We now, mm -hmm. now have a new Congress. And this thing comes flying through the House, what, a month ago? The House passed mm -hmm. the bill. Mm -hmm. No amendment, nothing to do with guns. 
representation for the district in the House of Representatives, mm -hmm. representation, one more seat for Utah, nothing in the Senate, but it's a start, mm -hmm. and that was it. There was nothing to do with guns. Oh, in the House? In the no, House. It has not been considered in the House. Yet. Right. So, but the House passed the bill without, without any amendment on it. In guns. 2007. Oh, they didn't pass it this year yet. No, the Senate, the Senate has passed it. it. Yes, I the see. Senate has passed it, but the House has not. Uh, it's kind of a rare role reversal, I right, think, right, where right. the Senate so the actually Senate takes it. The Senate started it, mm -hmm. and they threw in this amendment. Yes, okay. and, and the House right now, uh, the hang-up in the House is the, this whole uh, rules committee uh, now, issue. now, why couldn't Harry Reid, the majority mm -hmm. leader of the Democrats, say, sorry, Senator Ensign, we're not going to let you have this amendment? Uh, Steny Hoyer from the House? No, no, no. Or I'm talking about Major back in the Senate. When, oh, when back in the Senate. When yes. John Ensign put that amendment in the first place, couldn't they just say, sorry, uh, that amendment's out of order? You know, I, I don't know how much of it goes back to Senator Reid. I, I think, though, that there were a number of um, moderate uh, and newly elected Democrats um, who caved to the pressure of the NRA. So it's not just Republicans that support the Ensign Amendment. You have no. some Democrats, too. No, unfortunately, there were a number of Democrats as well. What was the vote on the amendment? Do you know offhand? It, I believe it was 62-4. Um, 62. So there are 41 Republicans. That means there are 20 Democrats mm -hmm. or you know, that's a lot. That's 40% of the Democrats. That's almost half the Democrats voted for this amendment. Yeah, and, and I think there, are, there was a lot of fear that the NRA was going to score this issue and that a lot of people would lose clout in their home districts. Well, let me just say this, and I, I, I admit I'm a Democrat. I'm proud to be a Democrat. Mm -hmm. I am ashamed of mm -hmm. the Democratic senators that mm -hmm. sold out the people of the District of Columbia and said, mm -hmm. in effect, we know better than you. Uh, what to decide for you. Mm -hmm. And I would hope that you're putting pressure not just on the Republicans, but on those Democrats, too, to change their minds. Absolutely. I mean, we, we've had so many different advocacy steps. We've been running um, online advertising, radio advertising, asking people to contact members of Congress. Um, when we found out about the Ensign Amendment, actually, uh, we knew that was going to come to the Senate. We had you just a few minutes notice, we launched a national call-in day, and in less than an hour, more than 400 people from across the United States called their members of the Senate to, uh, to urge them to vote against it. And of course, this program is heard not just in the district and uh, Northern Virginia, but throughout the United mm -hmm. States by many who listen at RadioInsideScoop.com. Uh, what are the prospects for having a clean bill from the Senate to, have, to, to get rid of the Ensign Amendment, to do this and to do it right? It's looking, it's looking better and better. Really? Uh, Majority Leader Steny Hoyer has really stepped out to the forefront. and, com and He's, of course, the Majority Leader in the House. Yes, in the House, to show his commitment for this um, and to show his commitment towards working through to a reasonable solution. So if the House passes the bill without the Ensign Amendment, mm -hmm. they pass a pure give rights to D.C., treat mm -hmm. them like they're Americans rather than yeah. occupied territory, then it goes to a committee Yes. where Democrats would be in control on both sides and could strip away the Ensign Amendment, right? Yes. Okay, so in essence, you don't even need the Senate at this point. Uh, I mean, you need them at the end of the yeah. process, but if the House passes the correct bill, mm -hmm. then you can at least get a, a solid bill out. Yes, and that, that would be a big step forward for this. Um, I, I think that there are so many people working right now and so many Americans on, the, on a clean bill and so many Americans across the United States who... Uh, agree that, you know, D.C. deserves their vote, and this amendment is absolutely ridiculous. Not to mention unnecessary. D.C. is already working on on uh, bringing, after the Heller decision, the, the decision that said that, okay, D.C., you cannot ban all uh, The United all States guns. Supreme Court decision, right? Exactly. Uh, on guns. Yeah, so after that, D.C. worked overtime to bring in emergency legislation, and that legislation is, is about equivalent to, what, Massachusetts, Hawaii, so New York? So other states already have other equivalent states. legislation. And frankly, if people don't like the legislation, they can do what, uh, what Mr. Heller did. They can sue. They can bring the Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. they, can, they can try to get their rights. That would be the way to do it. Um, when we come back, I want to talk about ways around this. I want to get a head count, if you have one, how many people in the House are supportive of a clean bill. And I want to talk about the idea that some have been proposing to simply separate the bill, to allow them to have this vote on taking away DC people, the people of DC's gun rights uh, to, to gun control, but also allowing them a separate vote on that bill as well. If you want to call in, it's 888 mark Back after this. Osama bin Laden calls getting nuclear weapons a religious duty. 
Today, materials that can be used to make nuclear weapons are stored in more than 40 countries. Sometimes protected by just a chain link fence. Yet not enough is being done to lock down these materials before terrorists steal them. Why did we learn all this? My mother. My son. My sister-in-law. Were all murdered September 11th. Help protect America. Together we can. Please join us. The stem cell issue is being debated throughout the country. Truth is, most everyone has an opinion, even if they don't know the facts. Let's stop arguing and start really understanding the potential of stem cell research. For us and for millions of Americans living with disabilities, get the facts. Call 1-877-842-3442 for free information from the Stem Cell Research Foundation. That's 1-877-842-3442. Following the tragic events of September 11th, there have been hundreds of violent attacks against innocent Americans. Remember what that flag you're waving stands for. Remember, please stop the hate. We're stronger when we are united. Remember. Remember what that flag you're waving stands for. One nation under God. Indivisible. With liberty. And justice. For all. In America, there's either room for everyone or it's not America. Don't pick the wrong fight. Let's keep America land of the free. Stop the hate. Planning a home renovation? Put this at the top of your to-do list. Because after 10 years, none of you are protected against tetanus and another potentially fatal disease, diphtheria. A minor injury, such as a cut or a scrape, can put you at risk for a tetanus infection. And while safety gear offers some protection, an up-to-date vaccination called the TD Booster is the best insurance against tetanus. So get the TD Booster. If it's been 10, do it again. Here again, The Inside Scoop with Mark Levine. Welcome back to The Inside Scoop. We're talking about whether the residents of the District of Columbia should enjoy the same democracy as the citizens of the 50 states, or should they permanently be second-class citizens? It seems like a really easy question, and yet there are problems. We've been talking about the problems all this hour with Jaylene Quinto. She is the communications director for DC Vote. And Jaylene, I gotta say, it it's, it's, it's looks bad. I mean, here is this chance. You've got a Democratic president, Democratic House and Senate. This would be the time more than ever mm -hmm. when DC residents should expect to have some fairness. And then comes this Ensign Amendment from out of the blue. I mean, is there a reason to be less optimistic about finally getting DC, uh, the residents of DC the right to vote? No, actually there's not. Uh, we're very optimistic and encouraged by uh, not only the fact that Steny Hoyer came out publicly last week and said that he's committed to bringing this bill to the floor for a vote. He's committed to finding a solution uh, to taking the gun amendment off of the bill. Um, but by his estimation, we should see something by, if not April, then early May. Really? That quickly? So I mean, within two months from today, yes. you think there's going to be a clean vote in the House on, to give D.C. residents the same rights as American citizens without any pesky gun amendment? We're, we're very optimistic that we're going to find some kind of a solution, and ideally that has nothing to do with a gun amendment, now that we find a completely clean bill. Now, surely those of you at D.C. Vote are doing head counts, every lobbyist organization does. <laughs> What, what are your numbers like? Well, we're, well, we're, first in, we're first in education and advocacy organization. All right, all right. But still, <laughs> um, I'm sure you have some idea. We, you know, we've been, we, I have to admit that we don't have a firm head count right now. It's been tough to get a read on that. We've uh, done a number of things. We've had a number of lobby days. Our executive director at one point was up on the Hill every single day. Um, I think we're getting, we're getting there. We're getting very close. And, and um, of course, the, the irony is that here, the DC's representative to the House of Representatives, mm -hmm. Eleanor Holmes Norton, mm -hmm. can't even have a vote on whether to give her residents a chance to vote. It's, it's a huge irony, but I have to say that uh, Delegate Norton has been such a huge advocate for the cause. Um, she obviously has a lot at stake, but she is working so diligently to make sure that this bill gets the attention that it deserves. Now there's been a bit of a uh, dispute between the delegate, Eleanor Holmes Norton mm -hmm. from DC, and the mayor of DC. Uh, in all other states he'd be called the governor, in the district he's called the mm -hmm. mayor, uh, Adrian Fenty. Uh, Eleanor Holmes Norton, as I understand her position, has said, mm -hmm. if we don't get a clean bill, we'll wait. We'll mm -hmm. get a clean bill. Fenty has said, look, I hate, I hate the mm -hmm. gun law, but better to give DC residents the right to vote 
uh, even with the gun amendment. So ironically, Eleanor Holmes Norton is voting against <laughs> her having a right to vote in Congress, and yeah. Fenty is supporting it. What do you make of this difference of opinion? Well, I, I think it's not surprising that there, there are a lot of dif people come down on different sides of the issue. Um, we're all committed to the same thing, which is getting this bill through Congress and passing it um, and quickly and getting it onto President Obama's desk for his signature. Uh, what Mayor Fenty said wasn't anything that we haven't heard before. You know, he said there are a lot of strategies at play, and that's absolutely true. I think uh, not only uh, our local elected officials, um, but Delegate Norton, um, DC Vote, our coalition partners like LCCR, we're all working towards that common goal. But we certainly are looking at a number of different strategies, and that's exactly what the mayor said. Well, let's talk about one of those strategies. One of the ones that people are proposing is the idea to allow a vote mm -hmm. on both, to allow one vote on giving DC uh, rights to have representative in, in the House, still not mm -hmm. in the Senate, so it's still not good enough as far as I'm concerned, mm -hmm. but it's a start, mm -hmm. and a separate vote on this Ensign Amendment to take away the gun rights of DC residents. Is that a proposal that DC Vote is willing to support? Uh, you know, that's a proposal that we've definitely looked at. Um, and I think that our commitment is first and foremost to getting this bill passed and getting a clean bill passed. Um, and then we're also, we're very active on uh, issues of home rule, local control, ha DC having local control over their own issues as gun laws. Not allowing a Nevada we, senator to write your laws for you. Exactly, exactly. So that if that were to come to a head, that we would be full steam ahead on trying to defeat anything that would interfere with uh, DC's right to uh, make their own laws. Of course, there's two issues here. One is how you feel about the bills. Mm -hmm. Obviously, DC Vote supports any bill that gives DC uh, the mm -hmm. residents of DC voting rights. Obviously, you're against any bill that goes against DC home rules. But then mm -hmm. there's the procedural question. Mm -hmm. Should they allow both bills up for a vote? Would we like to see that? No. Um, you know, but there there's a political reality that you have to face. You know, this isn't, uh, hasn't been an easy uh, fight for us over the last, uh, we've been working on this. 200 years? <laughs> 200 years. <laughs> you know, in this, in this bill alone, we've been working on for about five to six years. Um, so there, there's a harsh political reality, and what our, our commitment is still to make sure that D.C. residents are protected and that they get their vote in Congress. The toll-free number is 888-488-MARK, 888-488-6275. This is your last chance to call in. We hope to hear from you, 888-488-6275. Let me give you, Jaylene, my proposal, mm -hmm. uh, my solution to the problem, one that I think would really spell out the hypocrisy of those that support the Ensign Amendment. It's really very simple. Uh, you put a poison pill in the Ensign Amendment. Let me explain. During the Civil Rights era, there were people that were against civil rights for African Americans. They were against Title VII, the, Title VII, the provision of the, the Civil Rights Act of 1964 that allowed uh, people to vote. It really got around Jim Crow laws. So they decided, we're going to put in uh, rights to protect against discrimination for women as well. There are actually mm -hmm. some, some uh, racist, segregationist Southern senators that put in the part for women purposely because they thought, well, surely people won't agree to, to give women the same rights as men. Mm -hmm. Surely this will defeat the whole bill. Turns out that it went in, and that's part of our law today. Mm -hmm. Well, my strategy is uh, somewhat different, uh, but, but it has some similarities. My strategy is to say, John Ensign, if you believe that it is right that D.C. should have no gun laws, that it should have just the federal gun laws, no right to local mm -hmm. control, let's make it for everyone in the country. Let's mm -hmm. repeal all of the nation's gun laws. You want to force the people of D.C. who have no representation in Congress to accept your will mm -hmm. like the citizens of the occupied territories that they are. Okay, let's repeal all gun laws across the nation. Mm -hmm. Now, it's a dangerous strategy. I obviously don't want to repeal <laughs> all the gun laws across the nation. Yeah. I believe in gun control. But I think it would make a point. If you modify the Ensign Amendment, perhaps with support of the NRA, to say, we're not just going to end D.C. gun control laws, we're going to end all nationwide gun control yeah. laws, I can imagine this weird coalition of very conservative people and very liberal su people supporting it. Mm -hmm. The conservatives would do it because they hate all gun laws, and the liberals would support it because they see it as a poison pill. Yeah. And then people could go home and say, well, you know, I didn't think we should end Nevada's or California's or Montana's mm -hmm. uh, gun laws. That's why I voted against it. 
How about that strategy? Has that been talked about? Well, I, I think you're creative and you should join DC Vote because that's exactly <laughs> the kind of things that we're constantly looking at. Um, you know, I, I don't know to what extent uh, there have been closed door conversations about this exact issue, um, but there have certainly been proposals. The DC City Council members have uh, spoken out on this. Um, Mary Che, who is a member of the DC City Council, has um, written a letter and sent that up to the Hill saying, uh, you know, at a minimum, you should at least um, extend this these loosened gun laws to the capital area because, of course, Congress right. is Congress is watching their own backs. No, 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 on no, no, this. no, no, no. If, if we want <laughs> semi-automatics in the streets yeah. of Anacostia, they need to be right there in the Capitol yes. Dome. If Let's have want... a shootout. And if members of Congress don't like it, then maybe we need yeah. some gun control legislation. Yeah, so basically saying let's let's allow some visually impaired um, <laughs> person to bring person. a gun into the the, cap, the state capital. Yeah, no. I mean, it just shows the idiocy of it. Uh, I would want to know if people are pressing John Ensign, and frankly, mm -hmm. not just him, but you mentioned 62 senators or so that, that voted mm -hmm. for this thing, the Democrats as well as the Republicans. I want to mm -hmm. ask every single one of them, on the record, mm -hmm. would you support repealing all of the gun laws of your state? Has anyone been asked that question, or is the media not on the ball? No, they absolutely have been asked that, and actually our... Uh, uh, what have people the, said? Uh, Virginia's very own uh, Webb and Warner actually came out and, s and, and wouldn't answer the question. They, they refused they, to answer the, they well, refused the answer question. They refused to answer the question. They were asked that. Um, well, I think Mark Warner and Jim Webb need to answer the question. If they believe that the residents of D.C. should have no right mm -hmm. to determine any gun control laws, mm -hmm. that they should have all their gun control laws abolished, do they also believe that Virginia shouldn't have the same right? It's a fair question. They said, I refuse to answer? Yeah. They, that, they, I, will, I will tell they you, were that is intellectually in a, dishonest. They were I will asked condemn recent, the Virginia senators. And I would hope that if you live in Virginia, you will call Mark Warner, you'll call Jim Webb. I happen to work to elect both of them and say to them, if you don't want the residents of D.C., to have any gun control legislation, are you also believe that the, the residents of Virginia shouldn't have any gun control legislation? If it's fair to impose your will on people that didn't even vote for you, is it fair to impose your will on those that did? Has anyone answered that question? Not Who honestly. Voted to the no, I, I don't think anyone. You know, this. Do they all refuse to even answer the question? I, I have not seen John anyone. Ensign? I haven't seen anyone on record yet. You know, uh, John Ensign is is. is is a big NRA advocate, so he says. So he might say, "I don't want any gun control laws in Nevada." Has he said that? No, he has not. And <laughs> well, it's a fair question. Yes, he no, he, he's been asked, but he, uh, you know, he goes back to his uh, his standard response of the Second Amendment right is very important to him and well, then, preserving people. So he Second believes. So let's. So I would just say to him. I mean, I'm, yeah. it will, I'll invite him on the show. I don't think he'll come, <laughs> but I'll just say to him. So you believe mm -hmm. there should be no restrictions on gun? Let the mentally mm -hmm. ill have guns. We need more people like the Virginia Tech. Yeah shooter going in there mentally ill and mowing students down because that's the second amendment right yeah. is that what he's saying i don't know he won't I, answer the question i don't know and you know it, and beyond the gun issue it, you know whether you come down on the side of pro gun rights anti gun rights you know i think everyone would agree as a voter in their own district i have the right to tell my representative how to represent me what kind of laws i want uh, you know i remember and when there was a discussion on speed limits, there used to be a federal mm -hmm. law, I'm sure most Americans remember, when they set the speed limit as 55 miles an hour. Now, I was against that law because I believe in states' rights. I believe in local control, not states' rights to discriminate, no, not Jim Crow laws. But when it comes to speed limit, it makes sense for Montana to have a speed limit of 75, 80, 85. No speed limit if they want, while residents of D.C. and New York City, they're going to have much lower numbers. There's a large concentration of people. Republicans claim to believe in states' rights. They claim to believe in local control. Moderate Democrats claim to believe the same. When will we allow the people of D.C. to have the same rights that we all enjoy, the right to self-government, the reason, I think, why this country was founded? Kaylin Quinto, thank you very much. For thank you so me. much. I really do appreciate it. If you want to comment, go to my website, radioinsidescoop.com. This is Mark Levine, signing off.